It's December 21st and you are listening to Curiously Polar. Hello and welcome. It's Chris and Henry and Mario. Hello, everyone yeah. here. <laughs> Happy make, winter make some noise. Solstice. Make some noise. Wave, wave, yeah, wave yeah. into the solstice camera. It doesn't help the ones who listen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ah, so, Henry, uh, <clears throat> despite uh, having some episodes coming out over the last uh, month, um, some of that were pre-recorded with Henry, and uh, but he's now. This is la- this is the twenty first of December. We are really all like in we're front live, of live. the. <laughs> almost live, almost live. Um, yeah, Curiously Polar, the podcast about all things very north and very south. Um, Henry, you have just returned from the south, from the Antarctic. On my way back, almost. Almost on your way back. And uh, Maria, you are almost on your way <laughs> to somewhere in on the, the ice south. as well. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm far north and almost on the way far south. <laughs> yeah, so it's gonna be a long mm, journey. Okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, we have we have uh, found a time to meet and bring you a little holiday episode. Um, if you're watching this, I'm very proud of my work with all the snowflakes here. Beautiful. The, oh, if you don't screen. watch it and you you, you <laughs> just listen to the podcast, you should uh, hop over to YouTube just to see the snowflakes. They are just to have amazing. a quick <laughs> glance at the snowflakes. And and sorry, guys, I have to tell you, but these are all alike. All yeah. the snowflakes on the screen yeah. are the same one. We're just about to say <laughs> Doesn't that. Doesn't work like that so in they, nature. They don't stand scientific proof. <laughs> no, they're not scientific snowflakes for sure. Mm. Um, we do have a bunch of topics that we want to talk about and we want to finish off this episode with a little look at what we are going to do for this hopefully a bit quieter time of the year. Yeah. Oh, Henry starts laughing. <laughs> hopefully, I said hopefully. Okay, hopefully. I gave you, yes. I gave you an out, <laughs> too. Yes. Well, anyway, um, yeah. Let's let's look through some topics. We have a newsreel, and um, we'll uh, probably gonna start with um, Mario here. Yeah, I I wanted uh, to have a look at uh, some of the big things that have happened during the year, and uh, I think that the the most the, the biggest thing is this COP15, Conference of the Party 15, or the UN Biodiversity Conference that uh, was uh, held in Montreal uh, about uh, a week and a half ago or something. And, um, and that is, I think, has a potential to be a game changer and for the better for biodiversity and for the planet. And uh, I don't know. Have you have you heard it on the news, or do you have any ideas of what it not is about? Not as much. Not as much as I was hoping mm. for. So the coverage was for, well for me, but I, I don't really watch a lot of TV and mm. so on. So I might I might have missed something. But the channels that I get my news through mm. were relatively quiet on the COP15. Mm. My my Twitter was full of it, but uh, apart from that, it was not much in the mm. media now. Yeah. Well, um, the uh, and and this is this is really uh, really interesting. Maybe it is because of this uh, COP overload. I mean, conference or the parties. This COP, uh, there are many of them. And we just had the uh, just be- previous to to this one that I, we are mentioning. Uh, there was the conference on the climate in uh, Sharm El Sheikh, so the COP twenty seven for for the climate. You know, everybody knows about the Paris Agreement, the Paris COP, and uh, this was in uh, Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. Uh, something. Uh, news about uh, protection over the cryosphere, for example, that came out of there. But but this that I'm talking about here, that I wanted to bring to us and to our discussion, is uh, the um, conference of the parties of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, and uh, and this uh, UN organ is looking at the living part of the planet. So uh, we're not looking, I mean, you have the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that is the climate part, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the the physical part of our future. <laughs> now, the our future for as far as, as, as I'm concerned, as far as we are all concerned as humans, is based on the survival of biodiversity and the preservation of biodiversity. And we have been cutting out ecosystems. We have been, uh, we as humanity, we have been reducing biodiversity by enhancing monocultures, uh, 
like planting only corn, for example, and just having corn in a field in fields and fields and fields and killing out everything that would damage corn, like grazers or parasites or anything. And we're talking about anything from virus, viruses to, to larger organisms. And in this COP, the 180-something countries that are, uh, are the large majority of the 188 governments that are 95% of the, of the parties to the United Nations Convention on Bi Biological Diversity have agreed on four goals. And these four goals are especially that it is extremely, it seems, it seems evident, it seems like a child's thing there, but it is important that we preserve the ecosystem because if we kill the ecosystem, we kill ourselves. That's basically said. That's goal yeah. A. Yeah, like, uh, it sounds very logical. Um, yeah. Listening to a few people out there, that does yeah, not exactly. sink in with, with but, everyone. <laughs> but it really, it really now, it is important. It's like fixed on paper that the uh, biodiversity has to be, the, the reduction in biodiversity has to be halted totally by 2050. The, uh, the human-induced uh uh, extinction of species and not only that but biodiversity has to be restored we have to stop eliminating animals and plants and everything that goes with them and uh, and then we have also to reinstate ecosystems like restore ecosystems restore biodiversity and then now you are scrolling on the screen all the different targets because there are yeah, 23 different targets and these are more specifics and I don't think we should go there in the interest of time. Maybe we should keep on the other goals that are uh, actually, there are two other important things that I get out of this. And, and one is that we have seen previously something called ecosystem services. And ecosystem services is a concept in science, at least, and in, in management of, uh, of science, in monitorizing what nature is about. A tree gives an ecosystem service to, for example, the land by keeping the land with its roots and from sliding. But it is also something that is good to look at. So the tree has a, has a monetary value, like for economics, as a, as a pleasure <laughs> as a pleasurable thing to look at and and now the the uh, change here is uh having something called nature contribution to humanity like it's not anymore just purely a monetary thing it's also a contribution to how we as humans actually are um are, are a part of nature. And it's based on the South American concept of Pachamama. Uh, so the mother, mother earth, and this is a South American contribution to this convention. And then lastly, and then I'll let you comment if you have anything about this, <laughs> because uh, I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, it is that in the goals, there is a monetary aid, a monetary commitment and a monetary aid to countries that are less advantaged in order to achieve these goals. So countries that have exploited, for example, resources in other continents recognize that they do have a, a, an obligation, a practical obligation in helping restoring the ecosystems that have been damaged. Very simple. Cutting down the Amazon, yeah, it is of course in Brazil. It is mostly, uh, but it's not just Brazil that is benefiting from this or that has benefited, like in the industrial aspect of it, of course, and and therefore the countries that have received wood timber from Brazil, they should like actually contribute to restore the ecosystem in the Amazon. Now this is a very very simple and very maybe a little bit too uh, naive uh, uh, example, but it may give the, the picture of, of what it is about. And that is, everything has to be done like there are by 2050, we have a really hard deadline and we need to have a better earth for mm -hmm. our future. 
so this sounds very good. My my question with the uh, with all these uh, conferences and what they what they agree on is how much teeth does it have? Are what are there are there yeah. are there huge <clears throat> loopholes? Are there actually plans to close those loopholes and so on? I mean, there is no no um, international executive on top of that and i think that's the that's the, what the i mean biggest, yeah that's the biggest issue as long mm. as you don't have anyone to to enforce it to reinforce that there there is no proper um, ambition to do that and we see that with climate targets which has been increased and increased and increased mm. and still have never really been matched um so mm. we we are actually in a worse position than we have been like 20 years ago and for me i'm, I'm currently in a very fatalistic um state of mind when i just see those things they read Amazing! It's a great achievement that uh, people from all over the world come together, uh, talk about that, realize that biodiversity is the key to survival on planet Earth. It should be it's rocket just kind science. Of obvious, it's, you know, it's, yeah, but it's, 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 so it's obvious. The obvious. Yeah. But uh, essentially, what the outcome of that is is that, um, like, the people from all over the world agree on um, that. Um, on, on that fact, that they actually really realize we need to do something. How much? the governments actually are doing on that now that's the bigger question mark and that's just yeah. really something and that's that's for sure okay. and but but, I, but the, I agree the, on this, the, but. the the agreement of everyone there is a good first step i mean absolutely that's probably absolutely. what we can see yes yeah. like the uh, it's tragic as you're saying that <laughs> it's tragic that we have to agree on something that seems so obvious but it is uh, uh a fact that that we were not agreeing. I mean, on, on Earth, we were not agreeing on this before, which is amazing. And uh, and it's um, it's sad enough that you actually have yeah. to give uh, a monetary value to a tree for economy to actually consider not cutting down a tree. It's just sorry. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, it is tragic, but uh, there are there is hope for something to happen. Uh, I think that this uh, comes also into uh, the the bigger game. Like there has also been something that we haven't. Uh, I mean, it's not part of this, but uh, there is a convention on the ban of plastic, uh, or like the cr very powerful reduction of the use of plastics. Uh, there is also um, like something about uh, um, like we've seen uh, with the uh, with the sensitization of what is refuse like if if people are to be throwing away their food uh, rests the the remainders uh, or the food that has become too old or something well this is now has to be uh, sorted in in different bins i mean some countries are more advanced than others i mean southeast asia there are countries where it's actually compulsory i mean you cannot just take <laughs> throw the food out in the general garbage in a compost and it has to be sorted also just to sensitize people to mm -hmm. reduce i mean and uh, reduce their consumption and, our uh, our western civilizations do a really good job at hiding all the the garbage yeah. away from us um and uh, what i've seen in different parts of the world was mm. a very different handling of that and you come across like yeah. in in ethiopia you will uh, certainly come across big pits full of yeah. uh nestle plastic bottles yeah. that yeah. kind of stuff uh, like like in the in the tens yeah. of thousands that kind of yeah. stuff and you'll see this on the side of the road in some places yeah. so but uh, and in this case uh, like uh, the the advantage on this or the 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 learning from the climate cops here has been that uh, the convention the agreement uh, calls for uh, the establishment of a global global environment facility uh, so a, a special trust fund that supports the implementation of this um, so uh, so it is actually mentioned in the convention that this has to be done mm. uh, rather than yeah okay well we'll have to talk about it that is in the uh, in the climate cop right. uh, so there is there there are steps here and unfortunately of course uh, in all transfers of energy or money <laughs> uh, there are some leaks <laughs> and there are some some losses uh, along the way but uh, let's i mean i'm i'm keeping my fingers crossed for this one here and uh, and we'll follow on 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 this on this topic but i do uh, i do acknowledge uh, as well uh, henry's uh, 
skepticism, like sound oh, yeah, sure. skepticism. <laughs> you know, you know what we need. You know what we need. I mean, the the name cop is. We should have actual like robo cops to enforce yes. this stuff. Like <laughs> not the this, Beverly Hills one. This name should become a a, po a, a, a proper like uh, enforcement thing. Anyway, let's yes. get on with the next topic. New polar code regulations. What's that about? Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, this is. Uh, it was a really. Uh, Really interesting uh, new development. I, I just stumbled upon it uh, through a newsletter by the WWF Arctic, and I recognize this ship here, the uh, uh, Alexei Marishev, who, I mean, I lived in one of those containers after for my <laughs> first season in the Antarctic in 2006. That's uh, very interesting. But um, the, uh, the interesting part is that this ship, for example, was not uh, uh, allowed to sail anymore uh, because of the non-adherence to the Polar Code. And that was uh, about 10 years ago when they, uh, they stopped sailing with these, I think. Maybe Henry can, uh, can correct me there. No, but <coughs> but the, the, uh, the International Maritime Organization has uh, held a meeting now in November, at the beginning of November this year, and they've discussed how to improve the Polar Code to uh, like cater for all of the new vessels that are going, new and old vessels that are, that are going to the polar areas. In the North Atlantic, we see that there is less ice in the summer, so there are many, many more vessels that are going in areas that are still, I mean, even if there is less ice, it doesn't mean there, there is no ice, and even a small, like, one cubic meter of uh, ice uh, cube in the water can can be quite dangerous for for smaller vessels so the the new polar code is actually calling for measures to uh, make it safer for smaller vessels to travel in the uh, in the polar areas so uh, from everything from the hull to uh, guidance for voyage planning uh, like measures to uh, eliminate pollution as well for all the vessels have uh, different uh, i mean older um systems for for uh, for example for uh, storing diesel i mean fuel is, we have is seen adherence seen... is adherence to the polar code mandatory or is that uh, voluntary well it depends on which uh, para which paragraph which regulation but these uh, are initially said uh, as voluntary because uh, they would uh, harm the industry very much if uh, if you make it, if you make it mandatory now so late as i mean it, they have to have a time horizon for between what is uh, um what is uh, decided and when it is going to be mandatory and there are a couple usually of, there is of, a period of voluntary adherence and there's a couple of different regulations and um, the new navigation and voyage planning uh, regulations they will be mandatory from uh, i think 2026 on if i read that hmm. correctly yeah yeah, something like that. Because some th some things like voyage planning, they, they can be they can be done on a relatively short term and with relatively little uh, financial implications. But uh, changing, for example, the ice strengthening of a hull, uh, that is not something that can be done on a turn or a, or a dime. <laughs> and uh, and also, like uh, there are, uh, I mean, there are small vessels that are that that are. In, in this code and uh, at like above 24 meters but still still relatively small and they can be uh, they can be uh, for example like the ones that had hit the ground on uh, in uh, Bielefjord I think last summer a uh, small vessel uh, East Bjorn, uh, it starts uh, leaning on the side no damage to the hull but for example diesel leaks out because the they just fill the tanks and just a, a, an angle of uh, of uh, inclination on one side got the diesel out i mean these are things that require a structural change in the in the diesel tanks and that's not something one does very easily so so these are like there are uh, there are movements there towards something that uh, is uh, safer and uh, for uh, for the for the crews for the passengers for the guests but also for the environment and that's uh, I think that's a major uh, major background there. So the those regulations or those updates have been uh, developed under the impression of um, the change of uh, environment. And what we see is that not only a, a lot of new build vessels um, come into service, and those new build vessels usually are larger ones. So they already um, are under the polar code regulations, but 
um, it's also very uh, lucrative to actually bring all the vessels, convert them into uh, some sort of uh, yards, and bring mm-hmm. them into the, the the polar regions for um, tourism, for fishing, for whatsoever. But the older vessels have, um, because of their size, uh, flown under the radar, if you if you like, of the polar code, because the polar code yeah. has um, a size regulation there. And um, the big improvement here is that the size has been dropped the minimum size has been dropped for um, applying to the polar code and all those small vessels that have 12 guests and more which also fall fall under a lot of loopholes and other regulations they now have to comply with a lot of more regulations in the polar code as well which they didn't in the in the past and after having had an own experience um on one of those vessels uh, a couple of years ago um where I actually lost faith in, in, in that particular vessel, um, I really think um, it's it's necessary to have those um, being part of that set of regulations as well. Uh, the Polar Code has proven it works. It works for, for bigger vessels. And having the chance to get that onto the smaller vessels as well is a really big improvement. Yeah, I right. totally agree. And, uh, and as far as uh, what is compulsory and not compulsory, I mean, the... In in order to sail, for example, around Svalbard, one has to have a permit for navigation. And uh, if even if it if the rules are not universal, <laughs> at least for the application of this uh, uh, of this navigation permit, uh, like the uh, governor in Svalbard can can say, well, the ship has to apply to these regulations, even stricter than the Polar Code. But the, the Polar Code is usually uh, the standard which uh, the Norwegian authorities adhere to. So, so we have we have this, and Antarctica is a slightly different uh, situation because uh, the countries apply uh, the the operators apply to the country of the of their origin, let's say. So, mostly right. it can be can be different for different uh, different nations. Mm. But um, yeah, so an improvement as well here. So. Uh, in in the situation, let's hope. Let's see. Let's look at the future as uh, let's, let's revisit that, that brighter in, a, in and a safer. half a year from yeah. now and see how things mm-hmm. have uh, have yeah. actually come along. Uh, next up is a dive. Well, actually, not one dive. Fifty six dives in eleven days. What uh, what are we talking about here? Yeah. Well, you remember the uh, we talked uh, previously about the Franklin expedition several times. Yes. Northwest Passage. And uh, the Franklin expedition was composed of two vessels, the HMS Erebus and the HMS Terror. And uh, they have been localized a few years ago uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Canadian Arctic. And, um, well, these are ships that uh, s- sank in the mid-1800s and, uh, and they've been underwater since then. And uh, there is a mystery about... Uh, how and why things happened uh, with the uh, legends with uh, like stories that are more or less plausible and uh, now mm, the archaeologists are trying to figure out if they can find something in the wrecks of the ships uh, the Erebus is uh, in a shallower area so it's more prone to be destroyed by the movement of the water and the ice uh, the terror is deeper down, double as deep. So, uh, so we are talking uh, of a much safer position, um, and uh, therefore the concentration of the efforts is on the Erebus, so the shallower one. The divers uh, and these are marine archaeologists have to uh, comply to very a very serious permitting uh, process, including community consultations, and uh, they can only operate in a very narrow time window also because of weather and uh, i mean this is the high arctic in the canadian archipelago so they had this year they had 11 days and uh, in these 11 days they performed 56 dives and these dives are with uh, hot water cooled uh, diving equipment uh, so that they can stay down and and dive repeatedly the the same divers they can go down repeatedly and uh, what they found uh, is a ship that was left in spick span condition it's uh, it's very well preserved but they say even like all the drawers are closed and all the cabinets are closed and and they found artifacts that are very very delicate that they, they 
try to retrieve and now they will analyze like for example and this is one of the best example is a book uh, like a, a diary or something of some sort uh, they call it a folio uh, it's a, a leather bound volume with sheets inside and even a quill still put there in the in the cover and it was in the ship stores so it could be something with the ship stores or anything of course they haven't opened it and read it because water must <laughs> i mean the the uh, the effect of the water immersion and the time probably make it extremely difficult to to see what's what's in there i mean there are techniques and we have seen techniques with x-rays and others where you can where, where people have been trying to read messages in books i mean read what was written before even the in the palimpsest you know like where uh perg- perchma- parchment that had been been scraped clean and rewritten again so it is there is maybe a possibility of finding out what this is but uh, what what's written inside uh, in the future but uh, but also there is hope for finding even more than this for finding like ship's logs or, or or things that that can really explain the story tell the story of the last days of the franklin expedition or at least the last days of these ships Absolutely. so they have retrieved it but they have not um, really uh, well the, the next they to, step is now for for yeah. experts to take so yeah, part to, archaeologists have what it, pretty much what it might be just because where they found it they found the folio in the pantry um but now they are also focusing on the officers cabins and trying to find charts find diaries find logbooks and this is also something that goes um right with the stories the uh, local inuit are actually telling and that is that the ship might have been placed placed in that uh, bay deliberately. Um, it looks like that ship has been sailed down there by remaining uh, crew, which reboarded the ship after it got trapped in ice and got abandoned, um, sailed it down there. Um, and the position the ship has sunk, it just really went straight down. And that's something very, very interesting when you look at the underwater footage of the um, previous um, expeditions. It really has not even a broken mass. It just goes straight down. It, it's in a in a mm. fantastic shape, and that is really something that Pax Canada really wants to exploit. They really want to preserve what's there. They really want to preserve everything that's on board. And fifty six dives in eleven days. That's a, a big achievement. That's a lot. Yeah, it's, it's really they say lot, they yeah. they got like almost almost three hundred artifacts that were taken up, and uh, and and they are going. They're going deck by deck, so they are exploring uh, little by little because, of course, there is this uh, fine sediment on top of everything, and it's it's very important that one uh, doesn't move it around too much, so that that one can orient and work more it's most efficiently. Super efficient. slow, yeah. It's super so slow it's a, it's a slow, there. painstaking archaeologist work. It's not uh, really like going and finding dinosaur bones here. It's uh, finding very very uh, delicate uh, things like uh, clothes and and others and they they found for example a uh, like a, a map making equipment in a in a drawer and in the in the cabin of this uh, second lieutenant or second officer uh, that was in charge of the map making and and is like fantastic so let's uh, Let's keep let's keep looking, and it's it's great that uh, we have uh, or Canada has the possibility of financing these expeditions and uh, and and going down and trying to figure out what happened. Yeah, it's it's fantastic to get an idea of what that story really is about. Um, mm. th- there's a lot of guesswork um, in in history, obviously, mm. um, and having some more artifacts that probably give us a hint or a better idea of uh, what the situation has been. It's it's amazing to follow. Mm. All right. Yep. Up to the next topic. It's getting windy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this is like the the scientific uh, part of the of this episode, I think. And I I found this uh, this uh, post uh, on Carbon Brief. Um, it's uh, the authors of uh, this uh, article, uh, Tiffany Shaw, Professor Tiffany Shaw, who is at the University of Chicago. And I also gave the link of the of the actual article, which is a little bit more for the experts. Um, it's called Stormier Southern Hemisphere Induced by Topography and Ocean Circulation. So revealing why the Southern Hemisphere is actually 
um, is actually stormier. But we know that the that we have the uh, furious 50, the roaring 40s, furious 50s, and screaming 60s in the Southern Ocean, and uh, and like with like stories of huge waves. And of course, uh, we have already seen this season what the huge waves can do uh, on expedition ships. Um, but uh, like, why is it like this? I mean, these, uh, like on, on the screen now, we are seeing uh, some uh, um, diagrams, some figures that uh, pose it 90 degrees up on the top. So the southern hemisphere is actually flipped the other way around. But uh, the, there are three, three uh, squares or three diagrams uh, with the profile of land and, and then the, some colors that determine the... Uh, intensity of the storm or the frequency of the storms uh, so according to log longitude and latitude where do we have more storms and uh, and we can see also visually here that the uh, that the intensity or the the extent of the areas that are covered with the storms is uh, very large in the southern hemisphere the first the first uh, figure the second figure is the northern hemisphere and we have the storms mostly on the oceans on the northern pacific and the north atlantic but it's a much smaller area and looking at the combined figure we can see that uh, uh, the uh, uh, the storms are mostly around the uh, 40 degrees of uh, latitude so where we I mean 40 and 60 which is uh, the uh, areas uh, mostly where we uh, see on on both uh, on both hemispheres uh, where we have the storms but why do we have this and basically just to make a long story short we have uh, storms are created by difference in in energy content of uh, the uh, surface of the planet so the energy can be stored as heat we have seen it before it can be stored as heat in the uh, in the water in the sea water and in the atmosphere and uh, then energy is then transferred um, from the areas where energy is coming most intense in the uh, from the sun in the equatorial areas towards the poles but it moves the energy the water masses which are the main transport of energy in around the globe move in a different way in the northern and southern hemisphere we have talked before in one of the first episodes on about the ocean conveyor belt and probably also later um, we mentioned this several times the ocean conveyor belt is a current if we take the example of the of the atlantic the water heats up in the tropical areas there is a lot of sun energy coming to the surface of the water there the water evaporates is sucked up to the surface the surface water flows uh, towards the arctic and then it sinks and then it goes down to the Antarctic where it surfaces again. And, uh, and therefore, there is a, a, a large amount of energy that is taken down to the Antarctic. And the, uh, the gradient of, of energy differential is greater in the Antarctic than the, than the Arctic between the uh, areas that are close to the to the continents and uh, and the uh, and the areas that are in the subtropical areas, um, this is coupled and it's 50-50. The effect of this in the models is coupled with the mountain chains. The only 30% of the southern hemisphere is actually land areas, and there are mountains, but they're not that many. If you talk about the northern hemisphere, you have the Rockies, you have the Appalachians. Then you have all the, the Urals, you have like the, all the different, the Alps, you have the, uh, the Norwegian range uh, and, and uh, all of these mountains are actually like more or less north-south. Don't, don't forget the Himalayas. And the Himalayas, but those are more <laughs> east-west. This is why I'm not know, mentioning there. But the, the, <laughs> the north-west, the north-south uh, oriented mountain ranges, they slow down the movement of the air. And not only you have the continents that are blocking the transfer or, or the movement of the water masses with which contain energy, but also the also the the airflow is deviated by these uh, by the mountains. And so this this group from the University of Chicago, uh, headed by the University of Chicago, has looked at the at the uh, at the works uh, of the energy transfer. This is actually the subject of a Nobel 2021 piece, um, the physics prize. Uh, 
uh, and uh, and then and then couple this with model simulations and said why is it like this and they have checked with mountains models with mountains and without mountains with the ocean circulation and without the ocean circulation this conveyor belt and they've seen that these two factors are the main drivers of making the southern ocean more or the southern latitudes more stormy than the northern latitudes and when you look at the bathymetry map of the world's oceans just if you get the the, the whole world with bathymetry map you see that there is um much deeper elevations uh, in the southern ocean that there's much less friction for ocean currents uh, at 60 degree latitudes you can circumnavigate the globe um without any uh, obstacle in the southern hemisphere so you can circumnavigate antarctica at 60 degree latitudes without matching any land so the southern ocean uh, current is just something that really runs without an obstacle if uh, if you like so that just obviously is kind of an accelerator for that so for me that's yeah. a really interesting uh, topic really great to see um how that now has been uh, demystified Perfect. all right yes and uh Staying with, well, climate-related things, um, how about ice? <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, before uh, before we go to uh, to maybe the main topic here, <laughs> uh, I wanted to have a look at what the, what the actual uh, ice um, conditions are, both in the north and the south. So at the, uh, at the Center for uh, Earth Sciences of NASA, the Goddard Earth Sciences Division, there is a laboratory that looks at uh, at the uh, at the sea ice cover, and there are some uh, some really good. Uh, if you look at the links here, there are some really good uh, animations as well about uh, the and and pictures about uh, the uh, conditions. And uh, what uh, we see now is that the uh, um, the ice conditions in the Arctic seemed to be uh, like almost. Uh, optimistically very uh, very good at the beginning so the the ice was forming in november was forming extremely rapidly and uh, and now uh, the formation of the the ice has uh, has changed has, has slowed down but especially there is still a large area in the uh, northeast of the uh, or the Barents Sea or the uh, north of Russia, that is still ice free. That uh, should, like looking at the uh, at the uh, the statistics, it should have been by now uh, covered with ice. So we are at uh, not an extreme year for the uh, for the Arctic, at least not as far as the uh, as the uh, uh, extent is concerned. But uh, it is. Uh, it is not a uh, an optimistic uh, Arctic at the moment. We have to consider um, when we look at con uh, at the at the extent of sea ice. Then there are a, a couple of factors that scientists use to identify an area as um, covered with sea ice, and that is actually I think a little bit more than fifty percent um, covered with ice. Um, and that uh, qualifies for um, sea ice extent. Um, that doesn't give us any idea about the quality of the ice. And uh, just remembering from uh, the, the summer trips to the North Pole, seeing uh, in what bad shape the ice has been very early on in the season already um, mm. on the top of the world, um, that just gives you an idea that the, the cover uh, or the extent is 100% up there. Um, the concentration is a little less because you actually have open leads and the quality of the ice is terribly bad. Um, so you have really A, very thin ice flows, B, you have a lot of meltwater ponds on it. Um, mm. the, the snow has a um, has debris on it, which uh, accelerates the melt even further. So there are a couple of things coming together and the extent right now is not so much what worries but when we look also at temperature data we can see that uh, arctic area has uh, some 20 plus degrees uh, above the normal the average for this time of the year um, and that really um, yeah puts a big question mark there it's, it's really a reason to worry yeah and uh, and actually it's good that you're bringing this up i mean there are two concepts in this uh, in this uh, web page and one is the sea ice extent which is the uh, the sum of the areas of the grid cells that have at least 15% concentration and this is because the the uh, the let's say that the 
this comes from the way the ice is detected. The satellite picture has these pixels or these grid squares. Grid, so. And uh, and uh, if uh, the sum of the cells that have at least 15% of ice concentration uh, is counted, then we have the sea ice extent. And while the, uh, the uh, sea ice area is uh, the product of ice concentration and the areas of all the grid cells. So there are two slightly different concepts uh, in there. But yeah. uh, let's say that the, the sea ice area is the, like all the area where there is at least some ice. <laughs> while the sea ice concentration is more like where the ice is where there is like safe safely we can say that there is ice <laughs> yeah. and and the ice is is more compact but uh, in in general we are not uh, like if we say the the uh, the sea ice extent for uh, this year we are at 12.2 uh, uh, a million square kilometers on the 18th of, uh, of December, so a couple of days ago, and the minimum ever registered is the same, and it's in 2016. So for the day, today, we are at the minimum for the ice extent. And uh, and that is uh, like we are not we are not uh, in a, maybe there are some some reasons and they are saying yeah okay there has been a very very warm fall in Europe I mean a couple of weeks ago three or four weeks ago there were like thirty degrees in in northern Italy and and uh, in France and Spain but uh, still I mean this is an explanation but not uh, it's not uh, it's not very nice but uh, we can also go south and uh, see what the Antarctic is doing. And uh, the Antarctic ice area is not only much less this year, but also shifted in a strange, like in an unusual position. I don't know if, uh, I mean, you have not been south now, have you, uh, Henry? I've been uh, now. Yeah. Yes, year. I've been, yeah. I, have, uh, I just came back like two weeks ah, ago. Yeah, you came back. Yes, that's right. So uh, what, uh, what was your impression of the ice? Uh, there is none. Um, exactly. The, the the impression is that we have um, around the peninsula less ice than we had last year. Um, the Weddell Sea has, uh, in some parts, um, and around the eastern peninsula, less ice. But the Weddell Sea itself has more ice than last year. So it actually reaches further north. But the condition is uh, that you, even with an ice strength and ship, can easily push through it. It's, it's not mm. a consistent... Um, compact area. It just really uh, yeah. Yeah, flows with a lot of leads in between. Yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, and that is uh, that is also like uh, the 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 main message here is that we are not uh, we are we are experiencing another unusual year, and especially in the south, uh, the uh, the the abnormality is quite uh, quite visible. So. Um, so well, we'll uh, we'll see what the what the whole season would do. Uh, the change of the season uh, in three four months. We'll see what uh, what we have. Maximum ice extent in the Arctic and minimum in the Antarctic. And then in uh, when we'll uh, when we get there in uh, May, uh, we will have uh, the uh, the final balance for for this cycle. So. At the same time, um, we also see in Antarctica that weather patterns have shifted in a way that we have much more humidity. So we have much more mm. precipitation around the, the northern peninsula. So we have much, much more snow than we used to have. That already started last year when we had and, and some landing sites like three, four meters of snow on top yep. of, the, um, of the of the bad rock. Um, it's not that much this year, but it still is challenging on and, and, and some sites. And that's something that will accelerate in the next couple of years. People are then usually referring to, wow, uh, isn't that a good sign? No, it's not a good sign. More participation just changes the whole um, ecosystem uh, in, uh, in Antarctica, uh, particularly around the peninsula. So it's a, that's a really a worrying sign, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the effect of precipitation is so, so strange. I mean, you have uh, both uh, the, uh, the effect of uh, the albedo, but also the insulation factor of the precipitation. 
Yeah, yeah but it, it also disrupts the breeding cycles because yeah. um, the, oh, the, the penguins, for example, yeah, yeah. penguins all, all the, the, all the nesting yeah. animals, yeah, and uh, yeah, and I think that the one of the links that uh, we have here, we had also a link from the severeweather.eu, severe-weather.eu, and it has uh, some really good explanations and animations on the uh, on the uh, on what uh, what we're talking about, and uh, also like explanations of the different phenomena uh, so the the first the nasa site is more like a data uh, heavy site and this other one uh severeweather.eu is uh is uh, very good yeah that's for, that's the one i've been for, showing yeah. pictures from exactly. throughout this so um very i, I i'm i'm look, looking at these the, the picture says more than a thousand words, and this uh, is really true with this website. So definitely yeah. worth checking out. The link yes. is probably it's is like very likely in the show notes, or pretty yeah. definitely. And in the uh, and we also have uh, pictures of uh, like uh, calculations of sea ice thickness, yeah. uh, and especially for the Arctic, it's really important to see what uh, what the sea ice thickness actually is. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well we'll, well, we'll we'll keep on keeping tabs on this. On all this. Um, and this brings us to the part of our episode where we finally let the Christmas spirit in. And um, yeah, what are you guys up to for the rest of this year? It is the 21st, so we're getting close to the, well, what is it? The um, the, the holidays, the Christmas, uh, the quiet period. <laughs> Mario, uh, perfect. Sorry. I was almost not prepared. I don't have a Santa hat, so unfortunately. But but I do. But I do have some fairy lights back there. That hopefully counts for a we little bit. Over there, you can't. And Henry has it. the has the big Santa beard, even though <laughs> it's not <Big> white. <laughs> So I think I think we're quite good. So um, let, let me let me let me kick this off. So so for the holidays, um, it is in fact going to be a pretty quiet period. So if nothing planned for that um i will invest some time in a little photo project a little photo related nice. project let me let me show you wait so this is a box this is a wooden box an old wooden mm-hmm. box it used to have some lebkuchen in it lebkuchen. Um, whatever that is in in, in other languages but <laughs> gingerbread yes and it is full of weird it's no gingerbread f- no gingerbread in there it's full it's let me put this on the side it's not. It's not chocolate tablets. It's, is it? No, it's not. It's very, um, very disappointing. It, it is full with um, photography paraphern- paraphernalia from some part of my dad's family from uh, like ninety, eighty, ninety years back. So wow, it includes equipment for um like oh. chemistry equipment for the for the, the dark room for for making chemicals in this is an old measuring cylinder with engraved numbers that read. that's fantastic today you buy these things and they're made of plastic and it yep. has a whole bunch of these little boxes and envelopes in this is a cigarette oh. plate from Vogtlander and son and uh, these include Stacks of glass negatives, so you can put your uh, silver uh, mixture. Well, on they top are of it. they oh. are uh, they are exposed and developed. So what we ah. uh, let me let me get a white sheet of paper here. Um, that just reminds me on this. the endurance expedition when when so, exactly. needed to destroy <laughs> the negatives to not be tempted to go back to the ship to rescue them. So this this should give you an idea. There's like old. Okay. Um, it, it was one member of our family who was really into photography. Um, this box also includes his old camera. It's like a folding camera with the bellows and things. And um, uh, some great-great-grand-uncle was the photographer. Uh, he had his dark room. He developed these things. And so we're talking about some remnants of uh, my father's side of the family from back to before the Second World War, throughout the Second World War. I've seen... By holding it up to light, I've seen I've seen negatives of people with uniforms, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. um, family wow. portraits and that kind of stuff. Um, and my job is well, it has become my job um, <laughs> to to digitize them. So, I will set up uh, a copy stand with a camera and a light table, and then I'll um, digitize them using a DSLR, a photo, a photo, Fantastic. photographic camera. Very nice. 
So yeah, that's some some family archaeology. I, I'm probably, hopefully, not the one who needs to catalog all this because I would have no clue who's on them uh, on these pictures most of the time. But um, th I also include some bigger glass plates with documents, photographed documents on them, like old family um deeds and Certificates stuff whatever and, yeah. i've no idea what exactly we're well, going to find might there be entangled in some early espionage possibly possibly <laughs> um to to there, there is there is a legend that in some part of my family um there was a greek captain a sea uh -huh. captain so they have in in some in some far far back part of the family let me so, tell you you must be uh, related to Onassis. So, like, <laughs> probably so, soon. You're, soon you're going to be rich. <laughs> well, uh, uh, let let me let me hope I can find some rich uncle's uh, inheritance there somewhere. That would be really helpful right now. <laughs> so yeah, that's my Christmas project. And then the other thing that I'm um, uh, working on. I've just relaunched uh, my own website. So let me put in a shameless plug here uh, for my <laughs> own <laughs> website, chrismarkworth.com, which does not only include like uh, the things I have done, including like my photography oh. um, or my, my, my podcast productions, which uh, Curiously Polar is one of them. There's plenty more. But it also includes a link to uh, some tours and workshops that are coming up because 2023 um, I'm going to ramp up some of that again, including the Eastern European photo road trip, which mm -hmm. will, um, yes. which will uh, take place in an electric vehicle um, from starting from Berlin down to Dresden to Prague to Vienna to Budapest, and uh, ending up in Transylvania visiting Henry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking very much forward for that. So yeah, Hen Henry. And I'm looking forward to seeing a Northern Europe uh, tour as well. Well, up, up, up the up to Norway. Um, I, I'm not sure how long it'll take to drive up to Tromsø and how seasick you will get because of the curvy roads <laughs> along the coast. But <laughs> you just um, have to make enough stops. Anyway, so so this is this is uh, like like I, I can I can arrange that well with my conscience uh, to do an electric vehicle trip <laughs> yeah. um, these days. It sounds like. A lot of fun. I've done a scouting tour in summer, uh, visiting Henry. If you followed that part of my of my uh, stuff, then you've uh, seen a video with Henry in the car. Um, so yeah, this is a small group, very flexible, stopping in different places. It's a, almost a bit like a cruise, like you stop here, stop there, a bit of a tasting mm. buffet. Um, <laughs> we're not spending, well, probably Vienna will be probably two days. And it's really but, great um, because it's a very small group, so you have a good chance to be yes. very individual there. That That is exactly, it's, it's like a private tour pretty much. It is, um, yes. yeah. Like two to three people with me in the car. Um, it's, it's, it's quiet, so you can... While while we do like three hours of driving a day, we will be discussing photography and stuff. And yeah, um, so yeah, this is still open. Um, link is in the show notes, so you can you have a nice, possibly uh, come and meet me and Henry. Of you. What? you have a nice illustration of yourself uh, on the website. Who has done that? Um, oh, you mean <laughs> you, you mean this one? Yes, mm. I mean this one. <laughs> is that, that your brother again? No, that has been made by uh, by an AI. Hi. Okay. Ooh. So there are ways to make portraits these days that are, <laughs> yeah, different. So very nice. I'm I'm okay. happy about this. So yeah, that, that's me. And in, in, in over Christmas, I will work more on the preparations there. And yeah. So now follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> you first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Christmas will be hopefully um, rather quiet for me as well. Um, it's going to be the last Christmas, uh, just me and my wife. Um, so we we expect an additional family member early next year. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm getting ready to leave actually for Antarctica again, which I'm uh, having mixed feelings about. I would love to stay home um, just to experience the last uh, few months of uh, pregnancy, but at the same time I also. I'm really looking forward to meeting uh, friends again, being back on Ocean and uh, um, Ocean Adventure, and um, yeah, being one last time in those amazing places for a long time. And um, yeah, we, we're just going to spend some time with my uh, parents-in-law 
but uh, mainly at home here we, we made it very very nice and cozy um we got some some new decorations some new furniture and um yeah just building the nest for next year and uh, at the same time preparing a little bit <laughs> because i'm uh, joining as a history presenter um so i'm preparing a couple of lectures a couple of topics there um for the ship and that's going to be my christmas okay awesome. wow any any due date for 16th of march is the official due date okay. yeah beautiful right. and so it's gonna be a little a little boy ah okay. yeah we were hoping for a girl but we never will t uh, we'll never tell him so <laughs> 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 don't just just don't make a weird choice in name and uh, and that it's kind of stuff. Late. It's a it, it's a very manly name, <laughs> is it? <laughs> okay, well we, we'll find out soon Leo. enough. Hmm? What's the name? It's gonna be Leo. Leo. Okay, mm, okay. a lion. Yes. Um, so well, this this connects to my my Christmas. I'm yeah. gonna be having Leo and Adele here, uh, my 14 year old and my uh, seven year old boy and girl. Ah, they're going to be here go. with me uh, Christmas and New Year's, uh, so from tomorrow, actually. And uh, I'm really looking forward to having, a, I mean, it's been a while since we've had this uh, long period together. Uh, they, the past four years, they spent half of the time with their mom. So, uh, so I'm I'm really looking forward to that. I uh, well, it's the Arctic, so I hope that we're going to be going uh, skiing. It's going to be more or less uh, below zero most of the time, and uh, it's uh, right now we have about thirty centimeters of snow, not very much, but they are promising much more coming soon. The ice on the lakes is uh, very good for skating. So spending time outside is uh, especially good. Today is uh, almost uh, cloud-free and uh, and it's the winter solstice. So we are also going towards lighter times. That's nice. Yeah. And otherwise for the inside, I have uh, uh, three books that I'm really looking forward to see, to, to read. I found uh, a, a two books on uh, Charcot. Uh, the one is written by Charcot, is uh, Pourquoi pas dans l'Antarctique? Uh, so Pourquoi pas in the Antarctic? Yeah. Uh, by uh, uh, by the editor Arto, I had bought this a few years ago. These are most of them; they are rereads, and this is uh, the uh, the actual diaries of Chaco. And it's uh, fascinating to hear him telling things. But he, and he tells things also like uh, how hard it was to leave his wife, and 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 it's uh, like really nice. And uh, the other one, which is a, a very old. Uh, book. I don't know when it was published. I mean, this one here is found at a bookinist in in Paris. Uh, it's uh, from 37, 1937, with old prints of uh, of the Pourquoi pas, and uh, uh, it is uh, by Marguerite Verda, who is uh, um, talking about Charcot, Le Chevalier du Pôle, the uh, uh, the uh, Knight of the Pole. And, and that is, uh, I haven't read that one there, but I'm really looking forward to that. And finally, and I'm really optimistic because already <laughs> reading these two with two kids around, it's not going to be too easy. Uh, mostly we're going to be baking gingerbread <laughs> and, and eating them. Um, and the other one is this book, Master of Desolation Ooh, nice. by Captain J. Fuller, Joseph Fuller. And I have uh, friends uh, like French uh, a French couple here uh, he's a professor in ecology and they usually go to Kerguelen uh, with the uh, f to do research and to uh, to do some some field uh, research every year they just uh, uh, didn't do go for the during the covid uh, time um, and they had lent me the French translation of this and it's uh, this Captain Fuller is actually uh, one of the first, if not the first, that is describing Kerguelen. He, he uh, was a whaling captain and a sealing captain, and uh, from Connecticut, and he lived between 19, uh, 1839 until 1920, and he uh, went down to Kerguelen for sealing, uh, for a sealing expedition, like seal, uh, fur seal um, uh, hunting. And he describes the places, and uh, I 
am fascinated by uh, by 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 this description, especially when you take a map of Kerguelen with this uh, like starfish shaped island, and and looking at the different sites and trying to reconstruct this and the description of the of the difficulties of getting into this place on a on a wooden ship. It meets also like warships and it meets also like uh, ships that are like machine propelled, but it's, I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, this, when we're talking about expedition cruising, this is it. And finally, I'm going to get ready for going down south on the National Geographic Resolution. I'm, I've been, uh, offered to go there and uh, as an expedition leader and uh, so I'll um, I'll go down and uh, try to see again uh, old friends and uh, new ship relatively new ship ex bow they say it's a it's a, it's a must now <laughs> but uh, I wonder <laughs> and um, yeah so that would be mid uh, mid uh, January on the 16th I'm leaving Tromso so and uh, going down there for a month all Very right nice. Very nice. well what a year it has been i so. have uh, a few more things to add um oh then I, let me stop the music oh. <laughs> <laughs> but b- before we go there because um you actually came with those amazing books mario um funny enough i'm uh just finishing a biography <laughs> of charco um uh, written by uh, Tom Landier, which is a, a, an amazing um it's, it's a new release just released this year um, has beautiful prints in there. Uh, it's it's bilingual in French and English because my French is very poor. Uh, really great read. Um, a book I, I loved a lot this year, particularly working on Le Commandant Choco, on the icebreaker, mm. is the traditional sea ice mm. knowledge, um, knowing Seco. our ice, Seco. Yeah. It's an amazing project, um, which I discovered way too late, but it's so great to read all of the indigenous knowledge of, of sea ice and seeing that there is a, a big catalogue of, of sea ice uh, terms coming up. Um, a magazine that uh, just came out last year through Kickstarter is... Antarcticos, uh, made by mm. Dutch artist uh, Esther Kukmeyer, and uh, that's a, a mixture of art, uh, science, and literature. It's a really great read. It's a it's beautiful pictures, beautiful uh, text, um, really great uh, scientific papers in there as well. Uh, I hope the next volume is coming out very very soon. It's a really really great uh, project. In my function as history <laughs> presenter mapping uh, antarctica is wow. just really really a great thing a lot of old maps basically retelling the uh, exploration history of antarctica through maps and mm. that's just really really fantastic i'm a very visual person i love maps so that's really it and last but not least unfortunately that's in german but something i've I found in the falkland mm. islands is uh it's south georgia um uh, photo uh, book made by uh, Tease Martin and Kiki Erickson, and mm. uh, if you if you're around in the area, then you know who I'm talking about. And <clears throat> it's really amazing. I, I met them a, a, a few weeks ago. Um, they are the um, gatekeepers, basically, of um, West Point of West Point Island, the Falkland yep. Islands, which is one of my favorite stops. Amazing um, pastry, beautiful uh, scenery, yep. great, great tea, and teas and Kiki are just very, very uh, naturally happy people, and they just traveled the world on their ship uh, on, <laughs> on their little boat. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a little sailing boat, exactly. Yes, and um, a little wooden sailing boat. <laughs> yeah, for for twenty nine plus years, um, they are mm. living on that chi- uh, on that boat. It's it's really mm. great. Now they're living um, on West Point, and they're just uh, caretakers of of West Point, um, of mm. the farm, of the island. Really, really great. And uh, Tease is also a very, very good photographer. So this book uh, is just um, fully his um, his doing all the pictures. Uh, when he, when they actually spent a full year on South Georgia without an expedition in the background, just their small boat and just traveling from A to B 
all year round um, in South Georgia. And it's really great to see some insights from South Georgia in winter times, um, having yeah. some 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 nice narrative by himself on that as well. And uh, it's a it's published by Mara Verlag, which is like a, a, a German publishing house focusing on uh, ocean topics. It's really really great, um, really good quality. Um, I was really just happy to find that book uh, around, uh, particularly when you know the story behind those two people. It's really really great. So that's going to be my Christmas, just digging through that particular <laughs> book, and um, that's it from my side. <laughs> All right, as as we are all apparently now doing the book round, which I was not prepared for, I have grabbed a book which is right next to me, and that means I have recently been uh, looking into that. It's not ice related, it's not polar related, but uh, I still like it, and it's a photo related book, of course, because I'm a photographer, and that is the New York Taxi Backseat book, which is oh. a photography book, and it's it has it has some really awesome photography in it. Um, Of, uh, of a taxi driver in New York who um, not only did portraits of the people that he uh, carries around, but the places that he that he uh, that he stops at and that he sees on his way. And he's a really yeah. awesome photographer. So um, wow. his name is David Bradford. It's the New York Taxi Backseat Book. It's a, a smallish but not thin uh, coffee table book. Mm -hmm. So if you want to immerse yourself in some beautiful New York City black and white photography. <laughs> and I think that is a perfect end to this episode. Absolutely. I think. Um, so yeah, that was a year. Uh, that was a that was an interesting year. And uh, I'm glad that so we happy keep... Happy holidays. Yeah, happy, happy holidays. holidays. I'm glad we f keep finding the time to do these episodes. Uh, everyone have wonderful holidays, have a wonderful, hopefully quiet time and an awesome start into the next year. See you guys. And Same girls. to you guys. Cheers. Bye bye now. Take care. <laughs>